Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 422, for the 20th of November 2016. Richard Saunders here with you from Muggy Muggy Muggy, Overcast and Muggy, Sydney, Australia. Coming up on this week's show, another in the series of interviews from Iran Segev, who was lucky enough to go to the uh, QED convention, question, explore, discover, and this week Iran catches up with uh, Alice Howarth and Mike Hall from the Skeptics with a K podcast, one of my favourite podcasts coming out of Liverpool, Skeptics with a K. And so this week we'll find out a little bit more about two of the hosts, Alice and Mike, not Michael Marshall, he wasn't there at the time, during the interview at least, but I'm sure you'll find this interview with Mike and Alice very entertaining nevertheless. In fact, uh, as we speak, folks, as we speak, I think uh, Michael Marshall is getting himself ready to uh, get onto that flight uh, not uh, far away to come out here to Australia where he'll be speaking at the Australian Skeptics uh, National Convention. Of course, you all know about that by now in Melbourne, coming up um, next weekend. Wow, that's coming up quick, and I'm sure you'll have a great time there. Good news for Sydney people, Michael Marshall will be speaking at Skeptics in the Pub on the 29th of November, and I'll put a link in the show notes, or just join Aust Skeptics, A-U-S-T Skeptics, on Meetup, and you'll be sure to uh, snag your place. Skeptics in the pub, 29th of November, here in Sydney with Michael Marshall, special guest. What else do we have on this week's show? We're going to delve. That's a good word. I like that word. We're going to delve deeply into the archives of the Canberra Times, the newspaper from Canberra, and a series of reports and letters to the editor to do with sceptical activities over 30 years ago. Now, there was a mind-body wallet-type convention in Canberra many years ago, over 30 years ago. The sceptics turned up with big, uh, a big sign saying that they have uh, a prize of $20,000 then for proof of the paranormal. They got up the nose of the people running the uh, New Age Festival and uh, newspaper articles and letters, letters to the editor ensued. We're going to be following that little... Uh, exercise, that little trail, that little series of events from over 30 years ago, and you'll be surprised in a way how little things have changed, how little things have changed. Then I'm delighted to say we have a new segment on the Skeptic Zone. For those fans of A Week in Science that we used to run from the Royal Institution of Australia, we now have a new segment from Australia's Science Channel, which is run by the same people, Brouhaha. And this is short Science snippets, bits and pieces, brouhaha, coming up a little bit later on in the show. I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Nice, concise little uh, clips, snips, bits and pieces of science. Then to round off the show, it's the return of the Think Tank. Now, long-time listeners to the Skeptic Zone certainly remember the Think Tank, where we used to run down to our club at the end of the street in the Chinese restaurant, have a dinner and uh, chat about sceptical things. Well, this week, my old friend and uh, sceptic, long-time sceptic Steve Roberts, he's one of our UFO experts, joins us together with Maynard to discuss UFOs, amongst many other things, and old Australian mysteries and warp bubbles in clouds and codes and, and lots of different weird things. So join us later on in the show for the Think Tank. But now it's time for me to run downstairs, have a nice slice of Toast with honey. Butter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, hot toast. Butter. Let the butter melt into the toast a little bit. Lightly spread with some nice Australian honey. A good afternoon snack. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Let's all take this with a grain of salt. Here's Iran Segev. So, I have Alice and Mike from Skeptics with a K. 
Um, we'll start with Mike. Okay. Because you're the you you're kind of conference. you're kind of the brain behind QED. Well, I'm a brain behind QED. You're the brain behind <laughs> QED. Um, uh, no, uh, um, uh, Why does QED uh, exist? Q- QED's QED is a group project, and we all contribute, and it's 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 brilliant, and it is the product of the uh, fantastic six people who I say fantastic six people, the fantastic five people, and me who uh, work on fantastic six people work on time. those uh, uh, work on QED behind the scenes. Um, it's it's probably not wrong to say that a, a, a reasonable uh, chunk of what QED is about comes out of my personality of wanting to make sure that everything is just exactly right, which I get endless amounts of stick for. Um, <laughs> but it turns out that when when we apply to QED, it works really really well, which is uh, which is fantastic. And are you happy? Uh, I'm. I mean, it's Sunday night now. QED is over. It's Sunday so. night. QED finished about six hours ago. A little bit more than that. I'm exhausted. I'm not sure how much sleep I've had, um, but I think the event went well. I think people, it seemed to have gone smoothly. People seem to have enjoyed themselves. There's a lot of people upstairs in the bar are very happy at the moment, and I like there's a lot of people in this hotel at the moment who are happy because of stuff that we did. That's brilliant. That's, that's, that's made my weekend. Excellent. Because actually, that is the measure of success, isn't it? That that. You have sure. 666 people who came here yes. very yeah. appropriately. And, uh, magnificently, and we, didn't, we didn't fudge that here. <laughs> that, that's just how it worked out, which was brilliant. Um, but, yeah, we've, we've had a load of people that came down, 666 people, as you say. And, um, you, you know, they've, they've left very happy, as best we can tell. And that's, that's, that's the goal. We're not looking at taking people who believe in pseudoscience and trying to change their mind that's not really what QED is about uh, we like to challenge our audience but really it's a, it is a skeptic event for a skeptical audience you could argue that it's um, uh, preaching to the choir but it's it's more about celebrating the fact that there is a choir um, and we're not soloists as I'm sure a lot of skeptics felt before they discovered the skeptical community that there was you know that they were the only people who thought like this that they go really just is the whole of the rest of the world utterly irrational and doesn't see how much nonsense this is and then suddenly you discover this community and there's all these other people who think the same way you do and the it, you're not a soloist anymore you are in the choir the <laughs> fact that there is a choir is brilliant and that's uh that's something to celebrate that's something that we have so preaching to the choir i don't care it's brilliant that there is a choir and that we're gonna you know have fun with the fact that this community even exists uh, if i may add just that i don't think that we're preaching in these kind of events. Oh, no, no, no. So the point is, it's, it's something that re-energizes people and it makes them feel part of something. And I think that is hugely important. I've, I've obviously myself organized some conferences. Yeah. Uh, and I've heard this criticism about preaching to the crowd, but it's neither preaching nor is it the goal of the, this, this, mm. um, this kind of event. It's, it is really a social event and it's a time for people to meet other you know it's a networking event yeah and it's just time for people to to be together and as you say within you know celebrate the fact that there is a choir but not in the normal context of what we think of a choir (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. and and we do like to challenge the audience we like to put material on there that's going to push them and make them think and make them uh, uh, consider ideas in new ways but that's within the context of what we already agree on which is this the the evidence-based approach but if we can sneak around behind you and tap you on the shoulder and go, ah, but you didn't think about this thing from an evidence-based approach, did you? And people go, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's right. I need to start thinking about that and improving and being a better, uh, a, a better skeptic and a better person. That, that's, that's brilliant if we can do that. Now, speaking of, you know, speaking, speaking to the choir, I want to speak a little bit about uh, skeptics with a K. Okay. So how long has it been going now? Uh, seven years, I think now, just over seven years. We've been going 2000, 2009. We started August, August 2009. I think oh, it was. That, that is a while. So we've heard mostly your voice till now. And, but two and a half years ago, the week before QED, two and a half years ago. That's right, before QED, yeah. Uh, Colin um, made the mistake of deciding to have children. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, I've met Colin's children, uh, well, Colin, child. Colin's child in the, yeah. at, at the he's moment. A great I, boy. I don't know where else that's going, yeah. but he's lovely. <laughs> he's yeah. he's a sweet he boy. is lovely. 
Yeah. Nah, as, you know, I'm, a parent. I'm a parent myself. <laughs> we're, but, we're not going to yeah. criticize no, Colin, not gonna, yeah. Colin for having um, a child. Yeah. So, and, and Alice is the delightful re- replacement for Colin. Very different Colin. Yeah. And similar in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, you're a scientist. I am a scientist. Yeah. Almost PhD. Almost PhD. Yeah. Oh. I've, I've always been passionate about science and that's kind of what I try and bring to the show is my enthusiasm for science. Much to Marsha's uh, chagrin, I think. I don't <laughs> think he loves it, but <laughs> I love the science. So that's, that's the important thing, right? I actually, you know, as a listener, I think he does... Love it. I think he, just... he does. He does. I take I take the piss that Marsh yeah. doesn't like science, but um, he I think he does like science really. I think he just maybe... doesn't like the very detailed details that I like. I think I think he resents the fact that he can't make puns about some of the things that you talk about. But other than <laughs> that, the words are too complicated. They're yeah, not that's easy the thing. To make puns about. Yeah, but I think other than that, he he loves it. I think he likes the science. Yeah, he's yeah. read most of my thesis. It's quite, it quite impressive for somebody who hates science. <laughs> He's read most of his... He's read most of my thesis because uh, Marsh is a very good writer. Um, and so as I've been writing my thesis, he offered to, to, to proofread bits of my thesis. And so I've sent him all of my results chapters, most of my introduction. Um, he's read through most of it and, and proofread it and, and given me corrections on, not necessarily on the science, but, but on, the, on the grammar and, and, and the writing and how to improve how I'm presenting the work that I'm doing. So That is quite admirable. It is, for someone who hates science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, what, uh, do you have any, any plans for any, anything different that you're planning to do? Or are you just going to continue doing what you've been doing? With Skeptics with a K? Well, yes. well, we're probably going to you know, keep doing what we're doing. We do have uh, the, this idea of the, the day Alice hands her thesis in of doing a, uh, an episode a where... A drunken episode. Alice and Marsh are going to get completely drunk uh, in a massive, massive display of irresponsible behaviour. <laughs> um, I won't be participating in, in the drunkenness because I'm teetotal and have been like forever. Um, but uh, I can sit there and observe Marsh and Alice <laughs> getting... Because uh... you love seeing us drunk. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be an interesting episode. But no, we're going to keep doing the things that we, we, we know how to do, which is, you know, make, make fun of silly things that we see happen in the news. Sometimes we'll sit there and get indignant and angry about a serious point. But the show's really... Is, is, the show is conversations that we would be having anyway. We just stick a microphone in the middle before we have them. Um, so the the show's going to be what the show's going to be. We'll see that the the tone is going to change and evolve as we do. Um, Sometimes it ruins our actual conversations in the pub because we'll start having a conversation in the pub. Me, Marsh, and Mike, and Mike usually is the one to say, "No, let's save it for the show. Save this, is, it. this is the conversation we should be having save together it. for fun. We should save it for the show. The listeners will love this." We had a very long conversation at the Edinburgh Festival about two o'clock in the morning, where you were drunk and Marsh was Marsh drunk. Marsh was incredibly drunk. Um, it was his birthday. Uh, about about whether um, decapitating a footballer um, while trying to uh, when actually playing for the ball, if you could t- decapitate the footballer, is that a foul? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was a I, long, long conversation that went on much longer than it needed to. It did not need to be such a long I, conversation. Look, as, as, a, as a huge football fan... Right. Um, I must say that my question would be, which football? Because some footballers could ob- obviously live without their head. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get on to that part of the topic, I don't think. No, we did get as far as them uh, pre-perforating their necks before they came out onto <laughs> the was... pitch in order to make it easier for the head to come off. It doesn't work that way. Um, <laughs> not perforation not actually makes it stronger, don't you know? Have you ever seen toilet paper ever tear along the perforation? <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, then what do you think the perforation lines at the bottom of a postage stamp are for? That's for, <laughs> that's for peeling off the, uh, the perforations on the queen's neck. <laughs> um, that's what that's about. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we have some ridiculous conversations in person. Um, and every and so often we stick a microphone in the middle uh, and, and have those conversations on air. And we're going to keep doing that because it's what, it's what we enjoy doing. Well, the, the, the time we're going to stop doing the show is the time we're not enjoying it anymore. So you're going to continue doing the show oh, yes. for a very, very long time. <laughs> okay, that's very good to know. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, congratulations on a great conference and on a great podcast. Thank you. Thanks. 
Sziasztok! Szem privét! Hey Salihu! Guys, guys, I just had the most amazing experience. What experience, Andras? Andras, have you been to the pub? I told you not to hang out with Marsh. You know he was blessed by Peter Popov. <laughs> no, Yelena, I'm not talking about psychics. It was a really ESP experience. Uh, you have been to the pub. Either that or you've been smoking something. No, Pontus. The ESP is the European Skeptics Podcast. It's the most amazing thing. You get to know so much about skeptics and their activities across Europe. You know, events, hot topics and interviews with lots of interesting people. Oh, wow, cool. By the way, Pontus, you just committed the false dichotomy fallacy. I guess that means I'm really wrong. Yep. And you can even learn about those fallacies on the show and hear about people spreading silly ideas. You should really check it out. It's the ESP, the European Skeptics Podcast. It's on every week. All right, so where can I get this ESP experience? It sounds good. You can go online at theesp.eu, follow it on Twitter at espodcast underscore eu, or like the podcast on Facebook. Oh, and you can also contact the show by sending them an email to info at theesp.eu. And if you want to subscribe, do a quick search for the European Skeptic Podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes or Stitcher. I don't know how you can believe Recently I was asked to look into some old uh, paranormal cases here in Australia one of them being the Humpty Doo ghost or poltergeist from 1998 and the other being the uh, Knowles family UFO attack on the Nullarbor Plain way back in 1988. And I uh, knew a little about both of these situations, both of these stories, these cases, but I spent a couple of days um, doing a lot of research and I must say the best, the best uh, information I gleaned from the uh, internet on both these cases came from the pages of the Australian Skeptics magazine, The Skeptic, through the online search and PDFs available at skeptics.com.au. Now, I often mention this, but it's true. And the wealth of information from the pages of this journal is quite impressive. Uh, the Skeptics at the time did a lot of work, a lot of work, and wrote very comprehensive reports. But uh, during general investigations and searches... I uh, took advantage of a website, and if you're in Australia, you might not know, or maybe you do know of this website, it's called Trove, and the uh, URL is trove.nla.gov.au, and it's a wonderful uh, collection of digitized newspapers and journals going back many years. In fact, it says, find and get over... 518,292,042 518,292,042 Australian and online resources, books, images, historic newspapers, maps, music archives, and more. It's worth a look. And during my searches and investigations using this page, I came across an interesting chain of events that took place over 30 years ago in Canberra, where there was a, uh, a New Age festival way back in 1986. At first, I discovered a reply, a letter to the editor, talking about a previous letter to the editor. And I traced that back, and then I traced back the original report. What happened was there was a New Age festival, and the local skeptics from Canberra at the time turned up with a car with a huge sign on it offering a $20,000 reward for paranormal uh, proof of the paranormal. This got up the nose of the organizer, as you can imagine, the uh, the skeptics had a right of reply to the editor a little while later, and then somebody replied to the skeptic. So what I thought I'd do, I found it quite a, a fascinating little story. What I thought I'd do is I'd uh, relate these uh, reports to you. So we start with the first uh, report, and this comes from the Canberra Times newspaper, dated Sunday, May the twenty fifth, nineteen eighty six. Healers suggest a festival for skeptics. 
by James Gordon. Quote, If the Skeptics Association wants to promote a view, then let them run a festival for skepticism, end quote. Mr. Rod Roach, organizer of the second Canberra Alternative Medicine and ESP Festival, said yesterday, quote, I will not permit them to ride on the back of our publicity. People here have paid a lot of money to promote their ideas and feelings, end quote. The festival is being held at the Diplomat International Griffith, the grandeur of which is complemented by the kapora of the Russian Orthodox Church of St. John the Baptist rising behind it. As you approach the entrance, where there is a car manned by the Canberra Skeptics, with a sign on top offering $20,000 reward for just one proven psychic occurrence, you are welcomed by a young man in a black tie. You walk up the red carpet into a palace of brass rails and thick red guide ropes. Mr. Roach said the plush hotel had been chosen so, quote, the public can see that the people here are reputable people, end quote. Quote, I mean to say they pay a heck of a lot of money to come and do this, end quote, he said. It was hard to imagine a skeptics festival here. No quartz crystal balls. No fashion parade of clothes to show off auras. No, quote, rescue remedy, end quote, for, quote, emergencies, e.g. accidents, shocks, unconsciousness, fainting, emotional upset, sorrow, bad news, etc., end quote, for just, quote, five dollars per bottle, end quote. Perhaps just gloomy types in grey suits behind the public service surplus desks. If you had been working hard enough to get RSI, Surely there would be no harm in a small bottle of bark flower remedy. Mr. Roach said he understood that the verification proposed by the skeptics was, quote, so controlled that they can't get a result anyway, end quote. His wife and younger son firewalked, and had they known the skeptics were going to be there, they would have given a demonstration and, quote, you can't fake that one, end quote. In the 23 or so rooms used for demonstrations, there were only professional, dedicated people who did not, quote, fall into the category of trying something on, end quote. Asked to describe the difference between a professional and a charlatan, he said, quote, charlatans, dot, 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 I don't know what they are, end quote. He quoted a university teacher of conventional Australian medicine is saying that 85% of illness was self-limiting, and the biggest thing about alternative healers was that they had the time to care for the person while the correction went on. Traditional medicine could not hold the patient's hand for an hour once a week for three months. He and his wife Joan charged $30 for the first consultation, which was one and a half hours, and $20 for hour-long follow-ups. He was thinking it really should be $25 an hour. Quote, we can give them the tender, loving care they need, end quote, he said. Quote, it may be just sitting over a table and chatting and showing you're a caring person, end quote. At least seven people at the festival could cure eight out of ten headaches within ten minutes, with such treatments as herbal remedies, massage and relaxation. Such treatment stirred the patient's confidence but it was only a, quote, band-aid cure, end quote. Illness was caused by something wrong with the person's thinking, and the therapist had to touch the cause, the whole being, the physical, mental, and spiritual. Quote, our job in alternative medicine is not really to fix. It is to show the person the pathway along which, if they take it, they'll fix themselves. My understanding is that a lot of people that Jesus healed, in fact, later took on the same problem again, end quote. He had, quote, given them a quick zap, end quote. Quote, their symptoms went bang immediately, because he was the very best healer we have ever had, dot, dot, dot. But Jesus can't change their thinking. They've got their own free will, and they've had the opportunity to change their thinking, but they didn't all choose it, end quote. The festival is open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. today. And the article provides a picture. Jen Luddingham of Red Hill, a member of the Roach Clinic, performs kinesiology on Mrs. Nanette Dorosky of O'Connor at the Diplomat International yesterday. And another picture accompanying the article is a picture of two skeptics with a big sign on top of their car. Reward! $20,000 for genuine paranormal phenomenon. 
Canberra Skeptics members Mr Simon Brown left and Mr Guy McLinder, both of Turner, outside the Diplomat International with their challenge sign. In reply to this report, we have a letter to the editor dated Tuesday, May the 27th, 1986 in the Canberra Times. Skeptics Doubts Sir, Canberra skeptics take issue with the statements of Mr. Rod Roach, organiser of the Alternative Medicine and ESP Festival last weekend. The skeptics' offer of $20,000 for a demonstration of paranormal phenomena is not, quote, so controlled that they can't get a result anyway, end quote. The controls are normal scientific controls designed to eliminate results arising from chance, fraud, or self-deception on the part of the investigator or the subject. These skeptics had little to say about alternative medicine based on the use of herbs and acupuncture except to advise the public to exercise discretion in evaluating claims. The main problem with alternative medicine is that there are so many alternatives. The skeptics questioned more severely the presence of psychics and clairvoyance at the festival, engaging in character reading and predictions on the basis of methods such as astrology, tarot reading and numerology methods for which there is no acceptable scientific basis, and which have never yet been able to demonstrate results better than chance under controlled conditions. Mr. Roach also said that if he had known the skeptics were to be there, he would have organized a demonstration of firewalking, quote, and you can't fake that, end quote. However, research by skeptics indicates that firewalking does not involve any paranormal phenomena and can be done by anyone. It is also interesting that Mr. Roach claimed not to know what a, quote, charlatan, end quote, is. Every other organization dealing with the public is keen to expose its unethical practitioners to enhance the reputation of the, quote, professionals, end quote. On Mr. Roach's claim that the skeptics got free publicity from this festival, the boot may well be on the other foot. Certainly, psychics, mystics and healers were notoriously reluctant to gain any publicity from the well-attended skeptics conference in Melbourne last Easter. Also, Mr. Roach avoided any possibility of public debate with skeptics in Canberra. Mr. Roach also said that his, quote, people, end quote, paid, quote, a heck of a lot of money, end quote, to participate in his festival. Skeptics ask only whether they did this to gain public benefit or whether as, quote, professionals, end quote, they expected to recap a handsome profit from a gullible public. Don Laycock, Canberra Committee, Australian Skeptics, O'Connor. Finally, we have a reply to the letter to the editor from The Skeptics. And this is dated Wednesday, June the 4th, 1986, also in the Canberra Times. Doubting the Skeptics' View, received May 29. Sir, regarding the letter from the Canberra Committee of Australian Skeptics, Canberra Times, May 27th, was like stepping into a time capsule and watching the Inquisition question Galileo. I got the distinct impression that the skeptics are sorry that we do not burn at the stake anymore. I don't know what paranormal is. Not so long ago, hypnotism, telepathy, telekinesis et al. were spooky. Now they are recognized by orthodox science. Good heavens, what's the world coming to? We have departments of parapsychology in our institutions of learning. The skeptics talk of science and scientific methods. But what if some phenomena don't follow skeptics' rules? Does it mean the phenomena don't exist? The investigation of mediums is a case in point. Mediums are human. Some are good, some are bad. Some cheat. So what? Is the whole field therefore discredited? Is Beethoven a charlatan because he couldn't produce a masterpiece all the time? A whole range of phenomena now has a huge bank of evidence supporting it. 
various mental, physical and psychic phenomena. It's a pity it doesn't fall within the skeptic's black or white tabulation. But it exists nonetheless, and one would have to be ridiculously narrow-minded to pretend otherwise. Neither will these manifestations go away just because the Canberra Committee of Australian Skeptics says so. As for the $20,000, quote, reward, end quote, no wonder the skeptics are troubled by charlatans. They have issued an RSVP to every charlatan within miles. Knowledge cannot be bought. The skeptics would do much better to adopt a truly scientific attitude and go out among the healers, psychics and mediums and quietly investigate. Be open-minded, but not gullible. Admit that their well-defined universe may be boundless. As for firewalking, and I don't know if it is paranormal, it would be fun to see the skeptics, all in a row, hot-footing it across a fire pit made by the psychics. Perhaps the astrologers could predict what would happen. Larry Stitsky, Chifley. Now I'd like to draw your attention to something that uh, was mentioned in that last letter where Larry Stitsky says, The investigation of mediums is a case in point. Mediums are human. Some are good, some are bad, some cheat. So what? Is the whole field therefore discredited? Is Beethoven a charlatan because he couldn't produce masterpieces all the time? Question mark. It's a wonderful sort of straw man argument. Uh, and we get this a lot. Skeptics get this a lot. If we point out uh, things like predictions, for example, which we'll be covering very soon on the Skeptic Zone, the uh, psychic predictions for this year. And if we point out the fact that this prediction was wrong or this was wrong or they something tremendous happened which wasn't predicted and so on. The uh, the complaint we'll often get back is, oh, well, we're not perfect. Nobody said we can do it 100% of the time. As if skeptics ever said to uh, the psychics, you must be correct 100% of the time. It's a red herring. It's, it's ridiculous. Of course we never said that. But I like what he says here. Um, mediums are human. Well, yes... But they pretend to be so much more. They have abilities far beyond the normal human. And that's a whole other rabbit hole in itself. What skeptics would like to have, of course, is simply good evidence for the paranormal or the claims uh, made by these people. It doesn't have to be 100%. I think I've, we've never asked for 100%. It just has to be, of course, above, uh, well, above what chance would, would uh, predict. But there you go, an interesting chain of uh, reports from the skeptics way back in 1986 and uh, it's amazing what you uh, bump into so to speak on the internet when you're doing a little bit of research a link to the search engine i used in this week's show notes Now, direct from the cafe at Australia's Science Channel, it's Brouhaha with Tanya Meyer. Is the Bermuda Triangle still an unsolved paranormal mystery? Or have scientists just figured it out? Stories about ships and planes disappearing in the area between Bermuda, Florida and Puerto Rico date back to Christopher Columbus in 1492. What's making headlines now is that new satellite images have got a couple of scientists excited about hexagonal-shaped clouds. They say that these clouds cause microbursts or air bombs. Air comes down out of the cloud at around 170 miles per hour and hits the ocean, making waves up to 45 feet high. Now, there's a couple of problems with this. One is that no other scientists have got on board with this theory. Two, these clouds form in other places around the world without causing carnage. And three, the biggest problem is that the Bermuda Triangle doesn't even exist, people. It's fantasy. For more brouhaha and Australian science, 
head for www.australiascience.tv. Join us now for Drinking Skeptically in the Think Tank. Here we are, folks, at a well-known place with a few well-known voices, but I'll let it over to the man who's on the scene. It's a sceptic himself, Mr. Skeptic. <laughs> Mr. Hello, Maynard. Yes, we're back at the club down the end of the street. We're having a mini think tank. Haven't had one here for a long time. We're in the same restaurant where we always had the think tanks. And we've got a special guest. Steve Roberts, guy from Melbourne. Yeah, good day, mate. Yeah. And you, you always meet here you always meet here for Think Tank. Yeah. Oh, very civilized with a nice pub meal and yeah. ambiance and all, all the all the stuff. And your engineering specialty is cryptography? Yeah, the making and breaking of secret codes, yes. And what's the word for when they hide a code inside a, a JPEG thing? What's that called? That's called steganography. They, where you, they, where you still get into it, do they? It's where you hide that a message even exists. Um, they used to shave the head of a slave and write the message on it, wait for the hair to grow and send the poor bugger out. This was 3,000 years ago. Wow. But, yeah, you can hide stuff in a JPEG in the, in the low level of the JPEG. You can hide a message. It's easy to detect because you can just clean the JPEG up. You think, why are these bits at the low level of the JPEG that just make it noisy? Yeah. And you can take them out and there's a message. Yeah. Um, so that's the word for the day, stegnography. Now, Mina, you had a, a question for Steve a little bit earlier on about uh, the Bermuda Triangle and warp bubbles, which I thought was quite interesting. Look, as you know, I love listening to uh, all sorts of podcasts from around the place. And on the uh, recent uh, UFO podcast this week, there was a... Uh, Uh, David Perez, I think his name was, and he was talking about a warp drive that he's been working on. But he also said that it's possible that warp bubbles occur naturally within certain lightning storms because uh, they can, and and usually it destroys the objects that's in there, but sometimes you get a plane that will arrive early somewhere and it can be proved that it seems to have got there quicker because it's in some sort of warp bubble. Miguel Alcubier in 1994 came up with this uh, idea and theory about the fabric of space, being able to compress it and creating a local space warp bubble. Where within the side of the bubble, if it was a spacecraft or an aircraft, uh, which we have anecdotal evidence of, that the crew would be protected from the momentum. The point being is that a lot of people have observed a craft, a UFO that they have sighted, making 90-degree turns. Right. With an aircraft, you're not going to do that. You're going to be spamming a can if you're going, mm-hmm. you know, like Mach 3 or so. So there are limitations physically that you have in the air with uh, aerial vehicles that humans produce. On these particular craft, the momentum, the crew is protected. So you could turn on a dime. The warp bubble literally protects you. Do you think there's anything to this? Yeah, so it's the whole plane that arrives early. It doesn't have one wing missing. Yeah, or well, well, yeah, well, yeah, I think the other one's all crashed. And I think <laughs> there's, a, there's an example of four or five planes anecdotally in the entire history of the world that can be proved they arrived early by reasons that can't be explained. Yeah, you'd wonder if it, you know, maybe half the plane, including half of OD of the passengers, is in the warp bubble, the other half is not. That would be rather tragic. Um, you need you need the vomit bag, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, um, well, you were saying that there's a lot of power in a lightning storm, and, and it might be able to do this kind of thing in a random kind of way uh, around about the uh, Caribbean area. There, what, what, what do you think? What is there? Is there any way you could even test that? Because I mean, how could you mimic the energy in a lightning storm and put that into some way? Of, creating a warp bubble. It sounds a little bit advanced for me. Well, Benjamin Franklin went out in a lightning storm with a silk rope and a key and uh, nearly got into serious trouble. But yeah, there is a lot of power in a lightning storm, but to, to warp reality like that, you need a lot, a lot, lot, lot more power than that. Right, OK. Uh, the lightning storm just wouldn't do. You need to be able to sort of bend the planet or something. Um, okay. If you're going to distort reality, you know, it hasn't been done yet, but you need... Uh, well, to even to even think of it, you need a huge amount of power. And uh, well, well, uh, well uh, this David Preb is also uh, uh, positing that perhaps one of the reasons why UFOs seem to be able to turn and do things uh, without damaging who might be inside is because there might be some sort of minor some sort of minor warp bubble going on there, so they're not actually being affected by the G force changes. Uh, that would be without the lightning storm, then. Yes, but, that uh, would be yes. Sir. Maybe they have some secret of propulsion, um, and maybe they can. Maybe they can um, not obey the laws of physics because I mean the laws of physics are quite yeah, devastating in this sort of situation. Um, but if they have some 
a secret energy stores. You have to sort of warp reality and go into the fourth dimension. But, but don't the laws of physics allow for some sort of warping of space? No. <laughs> <laughs> So, hang on a minute. I've, I've, I've just been reading the wrong napkin back there. Obviously, there. Well, well Steve has uh, been on the uh, the Committee of Australian Skeptics for many, 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 many thirty plus years, of course, and he is uh, one of our UFO experts. And Steve, we were just discussing a little while ago this case in the outback from 1988 with the Knowles family. Oh, yeah. I think this is where there was some sort of residue on top of their car. Is that the one? Yeah, yeah. Well, you drive a car across the Nullarbor Plain and there's residue all over it, is all I can say. And if you, if you fall asleep and tip it off the road and it rolls over, there's more residue on it. Mm. And if you haven't serviced the brakes or washed the car lately, there's more residue on it still. And um, in the end, you can make a story out of it. Was there anything unusual about the residue, but No, it was the material from brake pads. So, so, sorry, so. For the, if you don't know, the, the listeners may yeah, not It's know. a fa- fairly famous one. It's, it's one of the ones that is held up by uh, many oh, yeah. people who are into the paranormal as being uh, because of the amount of uh, witnesses involved. Well, not re- well. Yeah, there wasn't that many. What happened was, for those who don't, who don't know, there was a family of four travelling across uh, the Australian desert. It was near dawn in a very remote area of uh, Western Australia in 1988, in January. And they claim they were chased by lights. Something landed on top of their car. There's mixed reports whether the car was lifted off the road or not, and a tyre was blown. Uh, but on, upon inspection, the car and the tyre, it was all consistent with a, t- a, a tyre being blown. All right. That, and, that's it. And uh, uh, who undertook the inspection, Steve? Well, they, um, they drove across the Nullarbor, driving all night, and clearly all four, of them, including the driver, were asleep. And the tyre burst, the car went off the road, rolled over. Well, I don't think it did. I don't think it rolled over. There was no evidence that it rolled over. It just came to a stop. But the people who undertook the analysis was the... Oh, I have, I've written it down. It's the something-something government or, or something lab or, or, or forensic lab. Uh, it, it just wasn't... Spe- the, the stuff on the car wasn't special. It was from the, da- the break. Mm, OK. Yeah, it makes a great story, though. And they, story. They, they thought they'd been abducted. They were on Steve Weizard's programme, and I was in the audience, and... Um, Weizard shredded them so much that there's no need for a sceptic. But um, he asked, what, 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 what do they do with the car? And they said, oh, we'll we sold it. And he said, yeah, I, I realise this. He pulled out an advert that he'd done in, on a big board, you know, uh, Tirana for sale, whatever it was, you know. Oh, Tirana? They're an awesome car. Was it an LJ or an X, XU1? It wasn't a Tirana. It wasn't a Tirana, no, yeah. Uh, what was it? So, so, so they were on the Steve Weiser, because I've got clips of them from all lots of chat shows at the time, yeah. but I, I have got nothing from the Steve Weiser show. Oh, That's you interesting. Missed, yeah. You missed so much there, Solis. I was in the audience, for God's sake, well, me and Perry Vlahos, and we even spoke on the, on the air. But, yeah, yeah, there's a car for sale, 20 million miles only, um, s- slightly poor condition. You know? <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, look, OK, Mr Funny Skeptic People, what about one of the uh, most mass uh, UFO sightings in Australia's history, which was in Melbourne, um, in Westall in 1966, the schools sighting. What, what do you make of that? Do you, uh, what, you, do you ever look into that one? Uh, not directly. I wasn't there at the time, but it was uh, heard from schoolboys. I think, I think what happened there was that some kid in the school saw something special. Um, I wouldn't say ufologically special, but, you know, a, a fire engine going by or something. And the story sort of got out of hand and was yes, going you. around in rumours. And um, the following morning, journalists turned up and began grilling the kids on the way into school. And, um, <clears throat> you know, just being a general nuisance. And the headmaster then said at that assembly, you know, nobody talk about this story. It's forbidden. I say so. I'm the headmaster. There'd be de- detentions handed out all round, you know. So after that, the kids would say, yeah, well, we saw something, but we were told not to talk about it. Well, there, there, Another another analysis. It was supposedly uh, the intervention of people in military uniforms. Yeah, again, I think what I would probably do is direct people to Brian Dunning's Skeptoid episode on Westall. He, he covered this. And yeah, I'd, I'd also recommend they have a look at the documentary on the same one to the people that uh, were involved. Um, uh, and I, I find that interesting because there are a lot of people who claim they, they saw something that day. Well, I don't know if anybody really saw something, but I think the, the rumour goes around there are only schoolboys and... Um, Maybe there was a policeman or something investigating that uniform characters and some mm. excitement, some official notice, you know, and the headmaster says, no, nah, no, nah, don't talk about this, and now it all becomes secret and thereby becomes a conspiracy of silence with uh, interference from the authorities and 
uh, you can just cash in on all that. He's you know. part of the... Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, now I have to kill you. Sorry. <laughs> well, well, what, what do you think, Richard? Because, you know, I'm, I'm always big on, on the fact that when people see these things, they can't always get a good photo because they happen quickly. Uh, often they're at night and you can't get a good photo even with a camera phone these days of some uh, bright object on a dark background like that. And yet people are repeatedly seeing something going on here. And you know, you know I've got one foot in that camp. Stay one foot in the grave, that's the expression. <laughs> yeah. uh, here's, here's, here's something that swayed me many years ago. I, I saw a talk by uh, Bob Schaefer, I think it was, famous UFO uh, investigator. He was in Australia, and he showed a picture of an astero- a comet, an asteroid, something that entered the Earth's atmosphere, which was only visible for a very short time as it streaked across the United States. Very short time. And yet, there are all these photographs of it. It was a very rare event. People had seconds to get their camera, and they did. They did. And he said, well, what about if there are UFOs everywhere, you know, buzzing the planet and abducting people? There's got to be more photographs, more good quality photographs, you know. And we've mentioned this on the Skeptic Zone before. Now we're all walking around with high-definition video cameras and ridiculous uh, things like this. There should be a, um, an avalanche of uh, spaceship photographs, and there's not. There's not. But has there been a recent UFO flap in Australia at all? No, there hasn't. The last one was Kelly Carlin in 1993, and that was a hallucination. I mean, as Richard said, everybody has a camera now, and it was actually even an advert for mobile phones when they were first invented. The Telstra put an advert out of somebody who, in a field is flying saucer lands, and they, he pulls out his mobile phone, which nobody had at the time, and they said, you know, they said quick, call somebody. Um, but in the early days, in the 1950s of George Adamski and those UFOs, um, people didn't even have cameras. You know, my father had one, and that, that was the family's camera. We got through one film a year or something, and it was exotic to even own a camera for the common man. <laughs> and now, of course, there's cameras everywhere, and everybody has one in their phone, and you know, school, school kids all have a camera. And uh, there should be a lot more UFO pictures, but there's actually a lot fewer UFO pictures. So that... okay, well, let's go to the UK where you're a little bit more. What about the uh, Reynoldsham Forest incident from, I think, 1980 it was, yeah, where, where, uh, where you have a, a military guy claiming he actually touched an object that landed that touched down? I don't remember the actual touching bit. But it was in uh, a forest in Norfolk where there's an American army base in 1980. And that one looks like the lights of a vehicle. Um, the story there seems to be... There was some jeep driving around when it shouldn't have been or something, and um, okay. somebody saw it. But um, it's all um, tied up in military stuff in, in that one. And, OK, um, yeah, because um, a lot of people claim it was the lighthouse that possibly could have been causing a light as well from the area. It was a bit in land, the lighthouse. It might, it might have been a lighthouse on the coast flashing. but I think mm. it was. I think that's, the, that's what I, I've seen, that it was a lighthouse, because every five seconds to the second... It, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. see, this is the typical conversation I have with these guys. I, I, I come up and say, "Hey, what about that?" And they go, "Yeah, um, yeah." Well, this is. You see, I used to be a UFO believer when I was a kid. I thought there's something going on. There's all these stories of the press. There were books about it, and I had a reverence for oh, books. Look, I love the stuff by Charles Berlitz. I think because he did the uh, uh, Berlitz, uh, the Bermuda Triangle ones and other ones are pretty good. George Adamski, I read a few of his books, yeah. and that yeah. there was a guy called Arthur Shuttlewood in Britain who was a, a local journalist on the Warminster Times, and he had a book that was a bit batty, but it was so successful he made so much money that he was able to buy his own printing press and churn out his own books. So there were lots of books about that. But, um, yeah, look, I was a a UFO believer, but, you know, bit by bit, the stories pale into insignificance. There's evidence comes up, they turn out to be hoaxes or not enough uh, evidence or... Um, this was, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend told me this and we'd track it down, there's nothing there. And in the end, even the most famous UFO sightings, one by one, turn out to be hoaxes or some kind of delusion and they're actually left with nothing, nothing in the pot at all. Is there one of the events or, or happenings that is yet to be um, uncovered that you think still needs a bit more investigation? I don't know of any. Um, they all go into the realm of there not being enough evidence or the stories are too fuzzy or there's, mm. there's no good photo. The photos are a lot of focus. Um, in particular, there is no photo from two angles of the same UFO. Oh, right. See, if something hovered over London or whatever, they'd be, if two people photographed it, you could see what the height was and the position and everything. That's never happened. Mm. There's only, only ever been one photo of the thing. Of course, we are here at the club at the end of the street there. What have you been investing your time in recently, Richard? Oh, well, I talk about this Nullarbor case because I, I was uh, interviewed uh, by a, a producer just recently, and he wanted to know about it, plus the Humpty Doo 
Humpty Doo Poltergeist. Say that quickly. Yeah. So that's I spent days researching both these uh, mysterious goings on from the past. Mm. Now that for our overseas listeners, that's great. The Humpty Doo Poltergeist. Yeah, um, yeah. Now is that the one up in the Northern no, Territory? No. Oh right, that was the one that when the fan went around, things happened. Yes, yeah. and right. somebody was caught in the reflection of of a, a glass cabinet. It appeared that somebody was throwing things. It it it, it dissipated quickly. I'll put it that way. But it was a it was a good case, and it's still held up by. Uh, poltergeist ghosty researchers as being a, a classic case, you know. And speaking of ghosts, you're, there's an interview with you in a ghost blog. This, I think it's Ghosts of Oz, OZ, and you're there having a bit of a chat about your history in, in scepticality. And I think, and I can quote you, uh, they asked you about me, and they, he said, Maynard, he's not much of a sceptic. <laughs> or I think it was something like that. And I stand by that statement. In, in fact, the folks in this week's show notes, there's a link to an interview with me from uh, Ghost of Oz. In, in fact, uh, uh, Alex Chaos, who we've interviewed before on the show. Yeah. Well, and it's great because you and Alex get, get in some pretty hot, bloody arguments yeah, on Facebook yeah, from time to time. You, like, you know, punching breaks out on Facebook between you and him. Well, I You're know. giving each other psychological wedgies. We, we are, we are. But in, at the end of the day, it's, it's fun to see him and uh, I talk at his conventions and we'll have, to, we'll have to try and get them to come into a sceptics one, I think. Look, look, that would be good. And I really, I mean, I know you were very uncomfortable in the room, but I really enjoyed at, at the uh, Paranormal Conference uh, where they were having that, that UFO chat about things. I thought that was great. It was great to be in a room where people were just letting these ideas go and I, I was loving it it was really good but yeah you, you were having trouble you were writing stuff down you, 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 your pencil broke it did and, and you you suggested to me that we should leave because yeah. you could see I was about yeah. to have a fit yeah. he, he was starting to hyperventilate you know when people were talking about close encounters of the <laughs> sixth kind look that one up folks that's when Richard, Richard's brain was leaving the room and I thought I think we need to get this guy some air I think we do well I think we should wind up in fact I'll just pour everybody another quick drink here so Ooh. we can mm. There we go. Yeah, there we go. So, uh, Maynard and... Oh, where's the microphone? Oh, Steve Roberts. Yeah, look, clearly the CIA got his pencil and put a break in the lead halfway up there. Oh, oh, so, as he's writing ghost notes, the pencil would break, and he oh. couldn't write any more. That's clearly what it was. You obviously got out there. I is... think so. <laughs> I've, I've been, I'm part of the conspiracy, after all. You well, are too. Uh, I am, hey, I am. Hey. Oh, <laughs> look, and if people want to know where I've been for the last couple of weeks, where I haven't been on the Skeptic Zone. I've, where have I've, you been? I've been on tour with the Benga Boys. Now, I, I know we, we've heard Richard Dawkins on this show earlier saying that they would never amount to nothing. And, and it's funny, the Venga boys say the same thing about Richard yeah, Vaughan Dawkins. It's just uncanny. It really is. Um, yeah, I've been on tour with them and, uh, oh, Crystal Waters, uh, Tina Cousins, a whole bunch of people. But all the details and a few interviews are there on maynard.com.au. Take along to there. But uh, it's great to be back here again. It's great to talk so It's great to talk the uncanny with you all. It's been nice to have another little mini think tank. So I'd like to thank Steve Roberts, Dr. Steve Roberts, and you, Maynard, for coming along. And until the next think tank, cheers. Yeah. Oh, they're plastic. Yeah, they're they're plastic. Yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Another conspiracy. Let's try this one. Cheers. Cheers. It never ends. A friend starts talking about his new Reiki master. And someone else just posted about another all-natural cancer cure that they don't want you to know about. As skeptics, we spend a lot of time trying to educate and protect those around us. But there is a way that you can reach millions. Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia is a group working to keep the best skeptical information at everyone's fingertips. Join us. We need writers, editors, translators. We need you. To join us or find out more, send a Facebook friend request to Susan Gerbic. That's G-E-R-B-I-C. Guerrilla Skepticism. The time is now. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. Now, I'm very excited in um, just a little under two weeks, something like that. I'll be heading out to Sydney Airport to catch a flight to Queenstown, New Zealand for the New Zealand Skeptics Conference 2016. And that's going to be in the first week end of December. You can get uh, more information and more importantly, snap up your tickets at conference.skeptics.nz. And a big shout out to all our New Zealand uh, uh, colleagues and comrades and friends over there and family. 
As some of you around the world may have noticed or seen in the news that there was a series of earthquakes or one big earthquake and lots of little tremors afterwards in New Zealand in the South Island, uh, quite a bit of damage done. Uh, lots of lands was uh, slips and uh, new lands created, oddly enough, as big earthquakes sometimes do. I think there was a small tsunami generated. Luckily, there wasn't, I think there was only two people, I believe only two people uh, sadly died. Well, that's not lucky, of course. Lucky there wasn't more. So uh, a big shout out to all our New Zealand friends and uh, family. But anyway, I'll be heading there. Uh, for the conference where I'll be giving a talk. I'm not I'm not sure what they want me to do just yet. Um, I might be giving a couple of talks. Anyway, I'll be sure to be mentioning psychics and how to do tricks and all sorts of things along the way. I'll be doing spoon bending, of course. I think there's some water divining involved and whatever else we can get up to. Uh, if you're in New Zealand, why not come along? It'd be lovely to meet you. Conference.skeptics.nz Coming up on next week's show, we're going to be uh, chatting about the recent talk here in Sydney, in fact, just last night. Dr. Lisa Randall, um, cosmologist, physicist from the United States, brought out courtesy of uh, the people, our friends at the Think Inc., Think Inc., who you hear us mentioning on the show from time to time. What a, what a fun night that was. What a fascinating night that was. Talk about warp bubbles. This was all about uh, dark energy and dark matter, which she said really should be called transparent matter, not dark. But it went into all those sort of things. Wonderful questions from the floor after the talk. It was a really um, enlightening and interesting evening. Anyway, next week we're going to be covering that with some interviews on the spot, on the scene from Maynard, who was also there with his microphone running around the audience. And thank you to our friends at Think Inc. for... uh, arranging all that. Also coming up on The Skeptic Zone next week, we have a review of a mind-body-wallet fair from, oh, almost 20 years ago, something like that, here in Sydney. And uh, it's good to delve, there's that word again, delve into the archives of the Australian Skeptics at skeptics.com.au and read reports of uh, other times about uh, skeptical goings-on. Now, here's a special note for our friends in the Melbourne area in Victoria. Coming up at the Morty Skeptics, and I've had the pleasure of speaking for the Morty Skeptics a number of years ago. On Thursday, November the 24th, Dr. Angie Matke from the USA with her talk, Medical Nonsense. Angie Matke is known to uh, Skeptics Zone listeners, of course. We chat to her from time to time. Well, lucky people down in Melbourne you have the chance to hear Dr. Angie Matke in person. So check out the site, uh, meetup.com slash Morty hyphen skeptics hyphen in hyphen the hyphen pub. (laughs) I'll put a link in the show notes. One uh, talk well worth going to, my friends. Dr. Angie Matke, medical nonsense. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders about to run downstairs yet again to get a nice cool glass of ice water. Signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for contacts, an archive of all episodes since 2008, and our online store. Please support the Skeptic Zone by following us on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, liking us on Facebook, and leaving a review on iTunes. You can also show your support by subscribing via PayPal for as little as 99 cents a week. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian Skeptics Inc. or any other skeptical organisations.